Hello everyone, my name is Laura Birkinshaw. I am an intern working with the Treated Spaces Research Group at the University of Hull. Treated Spaces at treatedspaces.com carries out a range of externally funded research projects and works closely with indigenous groups, activists, NGOs, museums and collaborators from across the globe. I am also a qualified history teacher. When I was teaching, I was frustrated by the approach taken to Indigenous history within the GCSE and A-level curricula, and by the lack of informed, up-to-date, available materials to help me teach it. As an intern with Treated Spaces, I've been looking closely at recent GCSE and A-level questions set by the five UK exam boards. I think the time is long overdue for exam boards to update their approach and give UK kids in schools a more historically accurate understanding of the Indigenous past in America. My central plea is for exam board questions to stop implying that all Indigenous Americans lived only in the West and that they have somehow vanished or been destroyed after the close of the frontier in the 1890. UK exam boards need to award more space to Indigenous voices across time and to update their whole approach to teaching understanding of the Indigenous world. The largest exam board in the UK is AQA. Here is one of their past papers for the module America 1840 to 1895, Expansion and Consolidation. On the right, you can see the interpretations that the first three questions refer to. Interpretation A is from a major who fought the Plains Indians and has a very negative perception of them, who believes they lack civilization or Christianity. In contrast, interpretation B from James McLaughlin presents the Plains Indians very positively as a misunderstood group that have a lot of wisdom and that have shown him a great deal of kindness. The first three exam questions ask students to read interpretations A and B in the interpretations booklet and answer. How does interpretation B differ from interpretation A about the Plains Indians? Explain your answer using interpretations A and B. Why might the authors of interpretations A and B have a different interpretation about the Plains Indians? Explain your answer using interpretations A and B and your contextual knowledge. Which interpretation do you find more convincing about the Plains Indians? Explain your answer using interpretations A and B and your contextual knowledge. Within the first three questions, the intention is to get students to discuss the content and provenance of the two interpretations. The last question then asks students to answer which of the following was the more important reason for the successful settlement of the Plains by 1895? The homesteaders, the defeat of the Plains Indians, explain your answer with reference to both bullet points. The last question is especially problematic because it suggests to students that all indigenous history in America is rooted in the West. In fact, the indigenous presence remains strong and continues to grow politically and numerically across the whole United States. Indigenous settler conflict in the West of the United States is just one part of America's story, the part that the Western movie focused on. Then there is the use of the term the Plains Indians. This suggests to students the indigenous presence on the Plains was homogenous. In fact, there were over 30 indigenous tribes living on the geographical area of the Great Plains at this time. These groups have their own languages, religious beliefs, customs and ways of life. Some groups on the plains were nomadic due to the introduction of horses to the southwest by the Spanish in the 1500s. This allowed some indigenous tribes to abandon their settlements and use horses to travel over the Great Plains and hunt bison. However, many of the indigenous tribes also lived as settled agriculturalists near river valleys or lived semi-sedentary lifestyles raiding, raising crops and hunting bison. Most problematic of all, question four suggests final Indian defeat. This is arguably true in a strictly military sense, but indigenous Americans still persist and uphold their sovereign status as nations. They have not disappeared and they are not confined to the past. Indeed, the current US Secretary of the Interior, Deb Haaland, is indigenous from Laguna Pueblo.
By the time students encounter the American Indigenous world at A-level, you might think the question set will be more complex and less problematic. This is not the case. As part of the module, The Birth of the USA, The Origins of the American Revolution, students were asked to read through the two sources on the right. Source A is from the great Indigenous leader Pontiac and argues that Indigenous people should resist encroachment upon their land by white settlers, whereas Source B suggests that the British government wanted to protect Indigenous lands against the encroachment through the Royal Proclamation. The question says, with reference to these sources and your understanding of the historical context, which of these two sources is more valuable in explaining obstacles to the colonists' Western expansion following the French Indian Wars? Within this question, indigenous peoples are contextualized as obstacles. In other questions, they are referred to as problems. Tribal names and tribal contexts are not invoked. Pontiac was Adawa. The long history and persistence today of female leadership within American indigenous communities is ignored. One of the biggest problems within past UK exam questions on indigenous history is that they have presented indigenous groups as a communities that no longer exist. This is shown in a specimen paper for the GCSE edXL module, The American West. Here students are asked to Write a narrative account analyzing the destruction of the traditional way of life of the Plains Indians in the years 1876 to 1895. You may use the following in your answer. Battle of Little Bighorn, Dawes Act. You must also use information of your own. As you can see, it is very likely that students may believe from this question that either the Plains Indians no longer exist or that they no longer practice or are able to practice traditional customs beliefs, etc. Today, just over 2 million Indigenous people live within the boundaries of the United States and traditional customs have proven highly resilient. In fact, they have proven impossible to destroy. Within the OCR A-level module, Civil Rights in the USA, 1865 to 1992, students study the development of civil rights for African Americans, Native Americans, women and trade unions over a longer period of time than a typical period study in the hopes that it will help students to analyse change and continuity. In the 2018 paper, one of the questions asked students to read through two passages. The first two passages are available via links so can, you can look at them in more detail, but for now I'm going to briefly summarise them. The first passage argues that the Dawes Act positively impacted Native Americans as they were able to gain citizenship and assimilate, even if their traditions and cultures could not be preserved. However, passage B argues that the Dawes Act didn't help Native Americans improve their civil rights and they lost their way of life. The author points out that Native Americans often didn't want citizenship or to assimilate anyway. Students were asked to evaluate the interpretations in both of the two passages and explain which you think is more convincing as an explanation of the impact of the Dawes Act on Native Americans. Students were also asked in this paper to answer the question, throughout the period 1865 to 1992, Native Americans took little action themselves to improve their civil rights. How far do you agree? The question covers a very long period and all of the United States. I can only assume it intends to be provocative given how inappropriate the suggestion made is. The question also gives the false impression to students that the Dawes Act granted indigenous people civil rights. In fact, indigenous people were not granted citizenship until the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Many Native American nations maintain that their rights are enshrined in treaties struck with settler nations are inherent to their sovereign status. The African American civil rights struggle is not directly comparable to the experience of indigenous Americans. However, the question implies it is. In the last few years, both WEJEC and CCEA have only had one GCSE question each which discussed Indigenous history. Here, this WeJet question asks for students to use source A and your own knowledge to describe how some Americans were treated due to their race. I presume here students are expected to point out how Indigenous children were forced to assimilate by attending American Indian boarding schools in the US 
the equivalent being residential schools in Canada. Of course, this experience was only part of a much wider process of dispossession and disadvantage forced upon Indigenous communities in this period. The use of the term race here is problematic, not least since it was used at the time to homogenize Indigenous diversity and justify oppression of Indigenous tribes, bands and communities. Race is also a cultural rather than biological term that is now infrequently used. It is much more usual since the Second World War to speak of ethnic groups. It would have been much more preferable if the children in the picture had been named or at a minimum their tribal affiliation given. After all, all Native Americans are not the same. One of the key issues with current indigenous exam board practice is that questions are phrased from an ethnocentric viewpoint, from the perspective of the colonizing nation or nations. This is shown in phrases such as, the arrival of white settlers and the coming of the railways, which negate the trauma inflicted on indigenous people due to successive non-indigenous migrations west. Another issue is the conflation of all indigenous history with the history of the rest. Students are given the impression that indigenous people were obstacles or problems which had to be overcome by homesteaders. A number of modules also attempt to group the experience of indigenous peoples into the experience of all Americans, presumably in the hope of encouraging students to compare different groups. Too often, I feel this isn't appropriate. It encourages misconceptions and inaccuracies about the indigenous experience. Another issue is that non-Indigenous legislation and or events are routinely described as especially important in the lives of Indigenous peoples in past exam questions. This negates Indigenous priorities and specific Indigenous ways of reckoning historical significance. Perhaps the single most important thing that needs to change is the way that exam boards insinuate that Indigenous groups no longer exist especially through describing them or their way of life as having been destroyed. There is also a conflation of African-American and indigenous history. This is connected to confusion about the date of indigenous citizenship and conflation of it with the civil rights era. Exam questions tend to show a lack of awareness of tribal diversity and of diversity of indigenous experience. The modules tend to either focus on the history of Wingenkong and the settlement of Jamestown or migrations west and the homesteaders interactions with the Plains Indians. Lastly, as in some thematic modules, indigenous history forms a very small part of the specification, questions on indigenous history are sometimes used as filler questions in exam papers. I hope you will show your support and join myself and the Treated Spaces team at treatedspaces.com in our campaign to change UK exam board Indigenous practice so that UK young people can finally be accurately taught histories of Indigenous America. Thank you very much for listening.